Hi, welcome everybody to the Be Healthy Summit and welcome Dr. Tyler Maltman. Well, thank you for having me, Stephanie. It's great to see you. Thank you for coming on the show, Tyler. Tyler Maltman is a family physician and yoga teacher from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Tyler currently works as a family physician in Plymouth, New Zealand, at an urgent care center, family practice, and as the doctor for the women's Taranaki rugby team. Previous to, he, to this, he worked in Saskatoon at the Mediclinic University Students Health Center as a clinical professor at the College of Medicine. So happy to have you on, Tyler. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What is your story? Yeah, well, I'm from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, as you mentioned, and that's uh, in the middle of the prairies of Canada. It's a very beautiful place, very hot in the summer, and one of the coldest places on the planet in the winter. Uh, I'm the oldest of four children, and my parents are both involved in healthcare. My mom's a family physician as well, and my dad's an equine veterinarian. So I always grew up around medicine and Saskatoon's where I did all of my education all the way through into medical school. And then I moved out to Victoria in British Columbia of Canada to complete my training in family medicine. Um, it was during medical school though that I became interested in holistic health and healing. And uh, that's what led me to uh, the practice of yoga and meditation and ultimately how I ended up meeting you. Um, I became interested in holistic healing because of chronic pain that I had. Uh, when I was 18, I had surgery on my left shoulder to repair a rotator cuff injury. And during that surgery, there was a complication where a medication was injected directly into the joint and killed all of my cartilage. So I had severe chronic pain and all that was offered to me from the traditional Western surgeons and physicians was more surgery and medication. And I was not interested in that because I didn't believe that it would actually help my problem. And so I decided to seek out what people use for healing before the advent of this modern medical system that I'd been a part of my whole life and benefited from a lot as well, but uh, was not able to find any help. And that's when I realized the power of meditation, the power of yoga, how to use food as medicine. And really that's what continues to drive my passion for holistic healing, the benefit that it's had in my life and now the benefits I see in my patients' lives. Um, I'm actually uh, recently accepted to the fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. So I'll be starting that in February 2020. And I'm really excited to become formally educated in integrative medicine so that I can incorporate that even more into my practice. Awesome. Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. So how is it now with your shoulder? Are you still in pain or did you find a way out? So it, now I say I live with chronic pain, uh, whereas before I was suffering from chronic pain. And so uh, I sitting here right now staring at you have no pain. And before I was in this daily routine of treating my pain. Um, I had constant pain that woke me up at night, that prevented me from being able to focus during exams, and uh, really just impacted my overall health in a very negative way. And uh, through this holistic approach to my chronic pain management, I can honestly say that my pain is well in control now, and that there's a lot of times where I have no pain and I'm able to sleep through the night and I'm able to participate in sports and my job without being distracted by the pain in my shoulder. 
Oh, that's wonderful. And you're actually super active in sports, right? Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, sports have been a part of my life since I was uh, a child. I grew up playing ice hockey. I've always been avid snowboarder. I love weightlifting. And all of those are very taxing on my joints, especially my shoulder. And so um, it's through a lot of these healing modalities, especially yoga, uh, that has allowed me to maintain the range of motion that I need and the strength with my injury to continue to participate and enjoy these sports because for a while I wasn't. For a while I stopped playing hockey. I stopped playing a lot of the sports I love because of the pain it would cause. And so um, having these daily maintenance regimes plus accessing complementary and alternative medicines, I've been able to regain my function to the point where I enjoy the sports again. Mm. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I, I know what you were talking about. I had the same thing when I was very much into martial arts and I actually overdid it and I was in so much pain, knee pain and back pain that I had to stop and that is so frustrating. And you just want to get back to sports. And for me, it was also yoga, which helped me. So can you go a little bit more into that? You, I know that you um, take yoga as a, a medical prescription actually for people when they have certain elements what do you do exactly yeah so the way that that all started for me was part of my treatment for the my own chronic pain and uh it's developed into the style of yoga that i now teach called medicinal yoga and medicinal to me is defined as anything that has a therapeutic benefit for a health condition and thereby including all types of yoga because they all have potential benefit for health conditions and so when i went to a healing center when i was at the the worst of my pain and i was able to receive individual lessons to learn how to adapt the postures of yoga for my injury to learn how to meditate for reducing stress. Um, I made a commitment at the end of my course to practice every day, twice a day, and really try and change the neural patterning around my pain to be able to have more range of motion and decrease the uh, stress responses through just this gentle repetition of healing movements because all the movements i'd practiced up until that point were not healing but quite the opposite just using my shoulder and so it was really the first time i learned how to um, access that internal capacity of healing in a, a conscious way and i learned that that was the only thing that worked to uh, take my pain away i actually achieved pain-free days for the first time in years when I had been practicing daily yoga and meditation. And as I became more aware of the science behind it, the evidence for it reducing stress, the evidence for anxiety, depression, and pain, um, I knew that it's something that I wanted to incorporate into my practice and share with my patients. And so I decided to learn more about writing prescriptions for these medicines. Um, and there was this study I read that showed patients were more likely to follow through with these uh, health changes if I not just counseled them, but also provided them a detailed prescription on how to practice, how often, how long. And so, uh, that started in my first year of independent practice after completing my residency, and I try and do it as often as possible. And I, I don't just limit it to yoga. I write prescriptions for exercise, meditation, anything else that has good evidence for uh, health conditions that are very common. Oh, that's so cool. And how do your patients react to that? Do they accept it? Um, 
Well, you know, I think that it's really important to meet people where they're at. You know, a lot of people are open to it and there's a lot of people who are maybe not um, interested in that type of prescription. And that's why uh, I don't try and do anything other than understand where people are going to have the greatest benefit. And really a lot of it comes from getting to know each person and uh, assessing their openness to these types of more natural healing methods. And generally, if people are open to it, they're quite happy to get a prescription for something uh, that's uh, not going to require them to spend any money and they can be uh, practiced regularly at home. And what do you focus on in medicinal yoga? Is it more strengthening or stretching or a combination of both? Um, so that depends on who the students are and why they're there. I believe it's very important in yoga to assess what your goals are and make sure you're achieving them in the safest way possible. And a lot of that comes back to uh, understanding your physical limitations, injuries, uh, your own unique skeleton shape, your myofascial restrictions from scar tissue, and then uh, what your intentions are and why you're there. And so I've done group classes for young groups of people like medical students where they prefer a bit more of the uh, vigorous yoga, the yang at the start, and then I'll finish with yin. And then I've done individual lessons where I'm helping somebody who has chronic back pain. And that is a lot more gentle style focused on them being more comfortable in moving their body in a safe way and exploring their uh, edge of range of motion. And so um, I really try and create an individualized approach. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I've also had amazing results um, when people were in pain with yin yoga. And do you know why that is? Why we focus on the fascia and that has a lot to do with our pain oftentimes. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so I mean, as you know, personally, it helped with your pain that you experienced and your injuries, and it's helped me a lot with the pain I experienced. And so um, I decided to try and learn as much about that as possible. And uh, the answer is we have some ideas, but we don't have the complete understanding yet from um, a scientific point of view as to why it works well for chronic pain for some people. Um, you know, and I, I guess that would be the main thing is it's not going to work for everybody, but I think something like yin yoga, if practiced in a safe way and, um, you're aware of your limitations generally has very little associated risk. And so in that, I, I think it's always worthwhile to at least explore if uh, this practice of yin yoga especially can work for chronic pain. I think that yin yoga works on multiple levels. It works on the mental uh, healing by reducing your stress. You know, it's, there's solid evidence to show that regular yoga practice decreases levels of your cortisol. And that's a stress hormone that is important in acute stress, but for chronic stresses, especially chronic pain is very detrimental to your health and exacerbates that pain. And so by practicing yin yoga, where you have these long postures that are meditative, you're gonna reduce your stress. And so that's one way that it works. The other way too uh, is, as you know, it works on connective tissue. The connective tissues are a substance that take time and um, patients to stretch out and they're quite different than muscle you know muscle can generally be effectively stretched within 30 to 60 seconds and you're not really gaining that much more benefit beyond that for a muscle whereas in yin yoga you're focusing on the stretching and stress healthy stress you can always overdo it but 
uh, the healthy stress of connective tissue, especially around joints. And I think that that remodeling of the connective tissue, especially for myself around my shoulder joint, uh, has been very beneficial to decreasing my pain through improving its range of motion. And I, from a more traditional yoga sense, um, in looking at the meridian theory and the flow of chi in the body, it helps to um, open those channels and allow energy flow better. Uh, and that's something that's very new in a scientific understanding. There is growing evidence and treatments like acupuncture access, the meridian theory, other things that have uh, evidence. It's becoming more of a known benefit, but that's something that's been around for thousands of years. And I think that that's why it's still practiced is because people have that intuitive sense of the improvement of the energy flow to certain areas of their body when they're practicing yin yoga. And so that's why I think it's so powerful is because it accesses all different aspects of your being. Yeah, that's also what I love about the practice. and. What you just mentioned about the muscle and the connective tissue just shows us how important it is to, to do both actually, to be active in sports, but to also do the stretching to um, yeah, make, it a, make it a perfect uh, combination, right? To not yeah, exactly. do one thing. Yeah. Because then it can just get too one-sided and that's also what I had in my martial arts practice I just did the yang part and not really the yin part and that's why I was depleted in my yin energy and that's why uh, I had all that pain because my fascia was actually screaming and wanted to tell me I also need some tension not just the muscles yeah. oh yeah. yeah yeah when your body's in pain like that you know I think you identified it correctly that it's telling you something it's trying to communicate and if you listen to pain as difficult as that is it can be one of the greatest teachers you'll ever have yeah absolutely i love that approach but so many people are not familiar with that that's that's why probably why so many people just say to your doctor i just want a pill <laughs> give me a pill to heal but that's not the, the way to go right yeah i think that it's important to uh look at where is the pain coming from? And I think it comes back to that idea that you want to create uh, a personalized approach rather than um, choosing conventional or natural, because a lot of the time you need to access both and making sure that you're utilizing it, especially if someone's in acute pain from surgery or an accident. And, and there are very effective medications that we have created through our advances in science that um, are amazing. But for chronic pain, uh, the evidence around medication, it, depending on the source of the pain, is really limited. And I think that's when it's essential to um, make sure people are accessing all of the holistic approach towards chronic pain, whether it's exercise, diet, nutrition, proper sleep, and everything else that will uh, help promote healing. Because, um, you know, as a society, uh, we are uh, all a part of this zeitgeist towards um, new technology, science, giving us a greater understanding of the world. And part of that has been the invention of these medications that are in the form of a pill and a lot of them save lives. Antibiotics save lives. Um, pain pills for people in acute pain get rid of their pain. And, and so we, we went through that exciting phase where we believed in the almost infinite expansion of our knowledge, especially in medicine. And you know there was this um, trend towards uh, an idea that we were gonna solve everything with it. But we have reached limitations in that now, and we know that, especially for chronic conditions, you uh, are quite often going to find more benefit with little to no negative side effects with these holistic and natural healing approaches. And so I think you're seeing 
people trending back towards the natural therapies and also a lot of people trying to find a balance between the two because they know that it's not one or the other but what works best for the individual at that time not easy though especially when you're going to try and change a habit like you practicing yang activity your whole life and now you have to uh, train your body and mind to enjoy yin and um, it, it takes time and I know that for myself it took many months and still takes a lot of effort to maintain that that balance between the two yes for sure <laughs> and you also mentioned nutrition and diet and I'm also a nutritionist myself and I see that there are so many people just super confused with all the diets which are around and they don't really know what opinions to follow anymore. What's, what's your approach to, the, to nutrition? What do you think makes sense? Uh, well, I think that uh, food should be looked at as medicine. And uh, that idea that everything that you're ingesting is going to become the building blocks of your cells. It's going to create the essence of who you are in a lot of ways and respecting it in that form is extremely important. Um, in terms of how to translate that into uh, a diet, um, it is challenging, especially now with all of the competing diets like you talked about and feeling confused. Uh, I know even for myself, the more that I've learned about it, sometimes the easier it is to feel confused based on conflicting evidence and based on different experts who are so certain that their way is the best way and uh and so i can understand why people feel overwhelmed when they're trying to make decisions about what kind of diet to follow and so after reviewing all of the different evidence and reviewing recommendations from experts and experimenting with my own diet um i, I guess i've tried to simplify it because i feel like it's very easy to become uh, caught up in the details and miss the overall point. And, and I think that number one, food should be enjoyed. It's something that should be flavorful and you should be excited about it. It shouldn't feel like a chore. Um, and, you know, I definitely would encourage people to have a balanced diet in a way where it doesn't feel like they're becoming ascetic and giving up everything they love. Um, because I don't think that anything like that is sustainable. So what do I recommend? Um, I recommend that people access as much natural, local, sustainable fruits and vegetables. If you're gonna access meats that they're from farms, hopefully within the area, or that they're grown in a more natural way. Same with fish, that you understanding where they're growing, what's the water like. Is, and in terms of how to choose vegetables and fruits, really a simple way that I like is making sure that you try and get as many different colors as possible because those different colors represent different nutrients. And so uh, I think that in keeping it simple like that uh, has helped me not become too focused in specific details because of course you need to refine it if you're someone who has diabetes or if you're someone who has a, a gastrointestinal condition that doesn't allow you to eat certain foods you're going to have to go into the details and you're going to have to remove certain foods but if you're somebody who is just looking to improve your overall health and you're generally doing quite well already to try and improve your diet uh, i think is really going to be more of a, a lifelong journey in trying to see what works best for you because i don't think there is something that you could go and just look up and then follow and have that be what is best because each individual i think it's like the yoga practice you have to adapt it to who you are and what you need what you're trying to accomplish with your physical activity. And so simple things that I encourage is making sure that you try and have 
a balance of protein, fat, and carbs with each meal. That you know uh, that you get a lot of fiber in your diet, and you can have add insoluble fibers like black seed and psyllium husks. Um, so, it, it, and again, it comes back to meeting each individual where they're at, and um, trying to assess what kind of information they want. Because some people want those details and they want to go deep into the science, and other people just want some. Uh, general guidance and uh, help navigating the the supermarket. Yeah, that makes so much sense. You are from Canada and now you live in New Zealand and I have a feeling that people there are more connected to nature. Um, can you share how they deal with their diets and nutrition? Do they have a more natural connection to it? Do they buy more local food? Or what would you say? Um, I think that there's a lot of similarities between Canada and New Zealand. You know, I think that in large urban centers in the big cities, Vancouver, Auckland, people are living very similar lifestyles where they're shopping in supermarkets and they're relying on that as their source of food. Um, but in New Zealand, there's definitely a lot of people who are living, uh, on farms, you're, you have a lot longer growing season over here in New Zealand. You know, people are, are able to uh, harvest almost year round in some places and produce. And so I think that's the, the biggest difference that I've seen. There are a lot of people who are very passionate about growing uh, their food locally in an organic, sustainable manner. And, and so I think that that's something that really allows for uh, people to achieve optimal health when you, you can do that. And um, in, in that way, it's much easier, you know, and especially in Saskatoon where I live, you know, there's times where it's below minus 20 and easily gets down to minus 40 or 50 sometimes. And so, um, yeah, it's a, a lot more difficult to access fresh fruits and vegetables than it is over here in uh, this subtropical New Zealand. Hmm. Would you recommend supplements then? Uh, yeah, I think that there's certain supplements that can provide benefit depending on the individual. Again, um, you know, I, I, I think that, for example, vitamin D supplementation, especially when you're not getting enough natural sunlight. And even if you are living in places with natural sunlight, most people now are wearing sunblocker and are inside it so much that... Uh, that's important to supplement. Um, there is growing evidence around the benefit of a multivitamin, um, especially if you're not, you know, achieving all the micronutrients from your diet, which can be quite difficult. And so it's important to make sure that you're accessing a healthy multivitamin because they're not all the same quality. And um, that those would be the, the two most common ones that I would recommend to people. Beyond that, it would be much more on an uh, individualized uh, basis, depending on their own health conditions. And so I, I try and um, steer people away from focusing too much on supplements and more towards focusing on their diet and getting all the nutrients in whole foods first, and then filling in anything that might be left with supplements if necessary. Yeah, I totally agree on vitamin D and I also take it as a supplement all, almost all year round because uh, in Europe it is really hard to get enough vitamin D even if you are out in the sun enough. So that can totally make sense to supplement there. And, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and if you're a vegetarian, I'm, I'm a vegetarian myself and I also supplement with vitamin B12. So... Um, because that's also something where people can have um, too little off. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I, you know, it's, if you're a vegetarian, it's important to make sure that you're getting enough adequate intake of nutrients like vitamin B12 that are not as easy to obtain, but uh, it is possible to get enough vitamin B12 in a vegetarian diet without supplements. However, you know, if you're concerned about it, it's something that I see quite frequently. 
with my patients, especially who are vegetarian, we'll check on their iron and vitamin B12 levels. And so I think that, you know, if you're concerned about that and you are vegetarian, it's a good idea to speak with your physician because we can test for that and assess whether you are uh, having enough absorption of the vitamin B12 and whether or not uh, a supplement is necessary. Because uh, as we've seen time and time again, that uh, overuse of anything, even if it is important, it has negative consequences. So I, I don't want anybody taking too much of vitamin D or vitamin B12. Um, because they can reach toxic levels potentially. Yeah, and it's it's pretty easy to find out about that and what by doing a blood test, right? I do that myself yeah. every year, and then you can see do I have enough? Am I still lacking? And I think that makes total sense to check it at least once a year. It doesn't even cost very much. Yeah, no, it's important to check, especially if you are vegetarian on those levels. Hmm. Tyler, what else do you think is important if a patient comes and says, I want to activate my self-healing capacities? Yeah, I think that it's important to um, make sure that you're taking that holistic approach, that you're looking at the physical, the mental, and you know, if people are open to it, the uh, spiritual aspect of healing and really trying to create a balance uh, between all of those different avenues. And so uh, I think quite often when someone is searching for optimizing their health, it's um, my job to help identify these areas that are lacking because anybody who's actively seeking to improve their health is usually put in a lot of effort already. And now with the amount of knowledge available they've done a lot of research and so um, it's important to try and identify areas that potentially can use very simple interventions um, that are quite powerful and so i think that that's where i like to start is just by understanding what their daily routine is like what their sleep routine is like what their diet is like getting someone to bring in a food journal that they keep for over a week and reviewing that understanding what it is that makes them feel excited, um, makes them feel enthusiastic. You know, when we talk about physical and mental health, that's a little bit more accepted and straightforward than when we say something like spiritual health, because for a lot of people that can carry religious connotations or put them off in, in a way that um, is not uh, desirable for, you know, improving your relationship, your therapeutic relationship. And so if people are interested in, in that aspect of health, I think of it as more of what is it that makes you feel connected to that inner sense of self, you know, that enthusiasm. When you look at the Greek root of the word enthusiasm and theos, it's connection to the God within. And so in that way, when you feel passionate and enthusiastic about life, you're accessing that part of you which is capable of channeling positive energy towards the areas of your life that you want to be successful in, in your personal life, with your relationships, in your professional life at work, and then in your own capacity to be creative in whatever form that may be for you. And so I think that, um, you know, these kind of consults are not quick consults. It takes time to uh, understand all of that and really uh, help people with it. But there are ways to accomplish it in shorter visits uh, when people are, are seeking that. And so it's something that I really enjoy because it has really benefited me to um, look at all of those different aspects of health. Oh, that's incredible. That's that's such an incredible approach, but um, most medical doctors don't have the time for that. Like you just said, I think on average, they have like seven minutes per patient, and that makes it really hard to find out what the reason is for their disease or ailments. What do you think people can do if their uh, doctor doesn't have the time to question these things? Where can they get help? 
Yeah, the time constraints put on physicians is a, a very real challenge. And it's difficult, especially when someone comes in with complicated chronic conditions or a serious acute problem to try and assess any of those other things, like I was saying. And that's why I enjoy being a, somebody who's trained in a Western conventional sense, because it is um, important to rule out any of the serious life-threatening illnesses and access all the investigations and ability to refer to surgeons and other uh, specialists for treatment of something that is more identifiable in the seven minutes, whereas the holistic approach is not always realistic in that time. Depending though, if you have a, a good relationship with somebody and you build it over time and people are seeking that, there are effective ways to uh, utilize uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and share this information where people can come away with some knowledge. Um, but yeah, it's often not realistic. And so if you're wanting this type of health and healing to um, be something that you're getting, you know, it's important in my opinion to, to have a team of healthcare practitioners. Uh, physicians, you know, a lot of the time I feel quite limited in my ability to practice uh, this holistic approach. And I think that when I feel like I'm not able to offer that because I'm focused on other specific diseases or conditions we're trying to treat and my patient wants to access this, that's when I think when we talk about expanding their healthcare team, including uh, a naturopathic physician. In, including an acupuncturist, including massage therapy, including a nutritionist, or any of the other numerous people who can provide significant benefit to them. And, and so I think it's really what it is that they want and who they're looking for, making sure that they access it. And um, that there is then also, if possible, communication developed between the healthcare practitioners. You know, I always appreciate it when I get a letter from a naturopath or any of the other um, healthcare practitioners taking part in the care of my patients and they send it back and uh, I'm able to understand their perspective on uh, this patient's health. And because a lot of the time they are able to take a, a much longer consult and a more detailed visit than I am in uh, the conventional system. Yeah, and unfortunately, oftentimes this doesn't get covered by insurance, um, at least not in Germany, but I think it's so very much worth it to pay for that yourself, to just, um, yeah, to just have that help from such wonderful experts. Yeah, that, I mean, the financial constraints on accessing a lot of the natural uh, methods of healing are uh, challenging and so if um, people are interested in it and not able to afford it, I, there's different educational resources that I recommend depending on what it is they're wanting to access. Or that's a time when I, I'm, if we have a few minutes, I try and share with them uh, one of the mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques that I've learned for them to practice and come back and go over or uh, something like a, a food journal. Um, Things like that that require uh, people to practice in their own life and then review again next visit um, is uh, something that I, I try. But um, there's a lot of information now available. Like you said, though, it's quite often confusing. And so making sure it's coming from credible resources if people are doing research the, and the resources are validated and have science behind them because um, if you are just searching without a healthy sense of skepticism, uh, you can quite often find information that can be detrimental. And so I always uh, warn people to take uh, time to reflect on everything and check its validity and ask for second opinions. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you also mentioned meditation a few times. What There are so many forms of meditations. What is there any specific form you would recommend to your patients? Uh, yeah, the one you do every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think that meditation is this uh, about as effective as brushing your teeth when it comes to the type of way you brush your teeth. It's about consistency and it's about making sure that you understand why you're doing it. And, and I don't always want to meditate. In fact, quite often I don't want to meditate at all. And there's a resistance I experience before I sit down or before I go for a walk or whatever it is that I'm doing. And so what I suggest for people is to um, find something that they enjoy. And if you don't enjoy it, at least that you don't despise it. And so if you don't like sitting, then I would not suggest to sit. I would suggest maybe go for a mindful walk or play music. You know, there's, there's a lot of forms of meditation that are very effective that at first glance, people might not look at them as what you consider meditation. Uh, I really try and um, provide many options. And most of the time, the option that people, especially initially, they're not choosing silent seated meditation. That's, that's uh, really quite a, a difficult posture to enjoy right off the bat. And so I, I think that the goal, at least for me, is that you utilize these practices. So a lot of the, one of the most common ones uh, would be a breath awareness meditation. And starting with just becoming aware of the sensation of the breath as it comes in, through your nose, enter your lungs, and providing some time reference. The four, seven, eight breathing in for four, hold for seven, exhale to eight is uh, a nice starting place if people are wanting that. If people prefer to move, I encourage a 10 minute walking meditation where you go somewhere calm, maybe you're listening to music while you're doing it, and just trying to experience the sensations of your feet against the ground. Um, but I mean, there's really no evidence to show that one form of meditation is going to have a more positive neurological impact on your brain than another. It's really about that you're doing it for at least 10 minutes or more a day consistently. And I also encourage variation. I, I would say continue to change it up. It's like exercise. If you continue to do the same exercise every time you go to the gym, you're not really going to get the same benefit that you did for the first 30 days. And so I, I like variation, especially in my own practice. And so I think it's fun to learn new ways. And especially now we have access to, if you're an app person, there's a lot of great meditation apps that even remind you it's time to meditate. Um, and if you don't like anything like that, then I encourage people to seek out something that works for them because the power of meditation to help prevent degeneration of the brain, to prevent Alzheimer's, um, to help with healing of traumatic brain injuries, to reduce anxiety, to reduce symptoms of depression, is, is so great that I, I think that some form of meditation is essential to be incorporated into your daily routine. Yes, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. And from my experience, I also had students who said, it's driving me crazy to sit still like that because we have so many type A personalities these days. And I think yin yoga can also be a wonderful approach to meditation, to dive into a pose and um, move very slowly. And you can also take that as a form of meditation and get deeply connected to yourself. I 100% agree. I think, you know, when you ask what is meditation and a, a lot of it really comes back to uh, anything that brings you into the present moment. and that in there decreases the stress of the mind and increases your awareness of your body and improves that mind body connection. And so physical asana of yoga is one of my favorite forms of meditation. Uh, exercise is maybe um, not the same in the way that I didn't really understand why exercise is not the same as meditation at the start because it has a lot of meditative properties. And the main difference that I understand now, because exercise is essential in my opinion too, 
but it's not a, a replacement for these types of meditation because in exercise you're so stimulated that you don't have the uh, same time and um, awareness to notice those subtle emotional shifts or changes or those subtle thoughts that quite often become more obvious when you are meditating. And I think that those uh, um, work synergistically rather than one or the other. Hmm. Yes, I love that. And um, what do you think, um, what do you think uh, about the holistic approach? Does that always have to take longer than the conventional approach or can we mix it or how do you know when to take what? Um, yeah, I think that it's important to remember that a lot of these natural healing methods are slow at times and do take patience and a lot of conventional treatments are effective immediately especially for someone who's got a, acute appendicitis that needs surgery they can remove the problem and that's one of the most amazing aspects of conventional medicine and i think that rather than developing an um, idea of how long something should take uh, it's more about accepting what it is that is the problem and learning how to deal with it in the most effective way possible and identifying is this an acute problem or a chronic problem and acute problems need to be dealt with rapidly whereas chronic problems require a slow patient approach and something in the form of a meditation practice is interesting though because a lot of the changes to your brain will occur over the course of a month or two. But within 10 minutes, you can decrease the level of cortisol in your blood, which decreases your stress. And so uh, I think it's a balance, even in any of these therapies, that you do get some benefit immediately and you get an even greater benefit in the long term. It's similar to your diet. If you change your diet for a few days, you can feel better quite often within those few days. But the real benefit is going to come when you get that sustained change to a healthier pattern of eating and living over the course of months and years. I would say the most powerful form of natural healing that is quite often forgotten is sleep. Uh, making sure that you get quality and enough quantity. For most people, that's in the seven to nine hour mark is the foundation of health. And so making sure that you're putting that as a high priority and that will help everything else in your health. Yes, absolutely. And do you think it makes sense to combine the two? For sure. Yeah, you know, I think that the general trend is going to be towards integrative medicine. And that's why I, I want to learn uh, more about this. That's why I, I applied to the fellowship because it accesses the best of conventional medicine and combines that with the best of natural complementary and alternative into really what I think of as personalized medicine. It's based on evidence and really takes into account the individual. And so I, I really like to think of being inclusive of all that works, but very skeptical of all of it, skeptical of any natural or conventional medicines without any solid evidence. And so I think that when we think about each individual and what they need, uh, a lot of the times it can fluctuate as well too. Sometimes the natural treatments have been working quite well, but then you'll need to provide a medication as an adjuvant to the treatment and that would be the most effective at that time and so i i encourage because i have some patients who don't want any conventional treatment at all um and, and i i think it's important for people to stay open to both hmm. and do you think the soul also plays a role when somebody gets a disease or an ailment i think that's you know uh 
what we were talking about earlier, the spiritual aspect of health. Um, it's something that you need to meet each individual at where they are. For me personally, I think it's essential. I think you know, looking at your soul, your spirit, um, as part of your health is really finding out what is it that makes you feel passionate and enthusiastic and what gives you purpose without going into any uh, specific belief systems or patterns of thinking that are, are taught to people. And so that's how I define it for myself is um, what is it that makes me feel passion and excited about life and not just internally, but externally with the people in my life who I love and care about, my family, my friends, and then finding purpose through my work. And, and in that way, when um, people are looking at a holistic approach, and, and I just like to ask them general questions to see if they have a belief system, if they belong to any specific community. And depending on that, the discussion goes from there. Um, and sometimes people are, are very open to it and other times none. And really, I don't think it, it matters if you have that discussion specifically, because by helping promote people's physical and mental health, naturally that will improve their overall spiritual health as well too. And so um, I think it's more of a, a quality of life. You know, you could, you eat, I think a lot of the times when you ask, how is your quality of life? That is potentially a measure of that um, aspect of health that, is not quite easily identifiable in any measured capacity that we have access to currently. Yes, and sometimes it can even be helpful for a person to get a disease to get back on track, right? When it's like, like your soul wants to tell you something and you're not listening and then you get a disease and get quiet again and um, rest more in stillness maybe and then you see, okay, I wasn't following my path anymore. I, I heard people say, I'm grateful that I got cancer because now I'm living the life that I want to live and I didn't do that before. I see that regularly as well. And even with myself and the chronic pain that I had for several years was the motivator to make changes in my life that have ultimately had a positive impact in the direction of everything that I'm doing. And so... I do think that it's uh, important to look at uh, disease and its root cause. And it really a lot of it, you know, is comes to a combination of genetic predisposition, but then also the environmental factors, your lifestyle, and um, they can be uh, an important motivator to make changes that you otherwise might not uh, find the time and energy to do if you're feeling well enough. Hmm. Keller, do you have any favorite success stories or your patients you want to share? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of um, very positive outcomes since I started uh, practicing from both conventional and natural healing um, and the combination of the two. Uh, one of the ones that comes to mind is uh, of a young woman in her early 20s who had had issues with chronic mental health problems since a young teenager, had been on multiple medications for a long time. And when I saw her, she felt like they weren't working anymore and that her mental health was um, in a state that had left her quite hopeless. And she had come to me because she knew that I was interested in holistic health and I taught yoga. And so um, we were able to create an entire plan of healing that included not just her conventional medication, which we kept as part of her treatment because for severe depression, it is important for people to be on medication. And also though we included for the first time complete reworking of her diet, uh, meditation, a yoga plan, and even went into talking about what are, were her goals? What did she want from life and getting her uh, focused again towards the future and being excited. And so 
over the course of 18 months, she was able to come off of her medications and had a job that she enjoyed, was in a relationship that she was happy with. And really, I think the thing that was most rewarding for me is she recognized her capacity for healing that had been there all along. And uh, I think that all the things that she learned will hopefully benefit her in the rest of any medical conditions that she might have throughout her life now that she uh, had this healthy routine. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Is there anything else you wanna share with us? Um, yeah, I, I think that medicine and health and healing can be quite overwhelming, especially now that there is so much information and so many potential effective treatments from both conventional and natural methods. And so I think it's very important to maintain an, an open but skeptical mind towards all of it, in that things need to have a physiological benefit they, that makes sense. They need to have evidence to support them if possible. And if there's no evidence, then there should be very low risk of harm because um, a, a lot of these treatments, whether it's yoga or anything like natural, just as conventional, can have a lot of potential negative side effects and risks. And so I think it's important that you check with your healthcare provider and try and access a, a team if possible and making sure that if you are doing research that it's from a credible source and you're double checking uh, where this information is coming from um, because I have seen a lot of contradictory information and I've seen a lot of amazing information that's accessible too and so uh, I think it's important as well to be open to change towards your own pattern of living uh, it's important to reevaluate balance and i know for myself trying to reevaluate my own life and balance is so important because as you know when you're writing a book or completing this health series it can be difficult to maintain that balance in when you're trying to be um, productive and so uh, i guess this holistic form of healing um, is very important, but it requires continual self-reflection as well and acknowledgement of when you need to have a little bit more yin yoga in your life and a little bit more relaxation. Um, and that would be the, the main takeaway point for me is I, I think it's very important to try and achieve optimal health and healing in, in a way that's sustainable. Yes, thank you so much. Now, I can imagine that a lot of people would love to work with a healthcare provider like you with a holistic approach. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, well, thank you. Um, it's I right now. I have a, a website that people could go to tylermaltman.com if they ever want to contact me. I have information there about medicinal yoga and the uh, other places you know i have social media accounts tyler moment on instagram and hopefully as i uh, move more towards my integrative fellowship i will also be creating more content based around integrative medicine and the combination of conventional and natural healing methods okay Thank you so, so very much for this inspiring interview, for sharing your time and your love. Thank you so much, Tyler. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Stephanie. It was, uh, it was great chatting with you today. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Yes, take care. Bye-bye. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.